morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Morgan Anabinet, and an assistant director in the Education Abroad Office. I've been in the office since 2015, and as of today, I'm responsible for supporting faculty-led programming while another position in our office is vacant. But I've been involved with these programs um, in some capacity throughout my time in the office. So just as a little bit of background before we dive in um, to the main content of our session, in the last five years, we've seen tremendous success in regards to education abroad faculty-led programming. We've seen an increase in programming by 23%, which led to our development of a faculty support staff member. And that was the position previously held by Jenna Reese White, whose name you might have seen before. Uh, Jenna was with our office for about two and a half years in that position and just moved on um, to an exciting new opportunity in the business school. More recently, USC strategic plan expects a 5% increase each year in study abroad from now until 2025. In addition to study abroad specifically, the university is looking for 10% of the student body to graduate with GLD by 2025, which can be achieved through several pathways, including the global pathway. The plan also calls for a 10% increase in experimental engagement through 2025, which is supported by education abroad programming. Additionally, the university is looking to formalize and explore strategies and techniques to create virtual online experimental opportunities and introduce the maximum number of online experimental programs feasible until 2023. So with all of these goals in mind, we are excited to present an opportunity today that fits these objectives. Yes, uh, thank you, Morgan. My name is James Jacobs. I'll be helping to uh, facilitate this session today. Uh, I am the administrative coordinator for Global Carolina. What that essentially means is that I work to facilitate communication between the uh, units within Global Carolina, and I also help to facilitate uh, programming and communication uh, from Global Carolina to other uh, departments of the university. So um, that means that I'm here today helping to facilitate this and I have also been facilitating the virtual IPHE, uh, that's International uh, Perspectives on Higher Education program to Ghana um, in, in early 2021. Um, and that's our first major kind of foray into virtual global learning experiences. Um, so the main kind of thrust of, of these experiences for students is to give them an opportunity to experience uh, international education in a way that they can get their experiential learning requirements and their graduating with leadership distinction requirements in a way that is accessible and safe, especially right now with our uh, current global uh, health situation. Um, so we can just move right along here. Um, so we have touched on our learning uh, objectives here a little bit, but our main um, objectives for y'all are uh, to inform you about the historical context of online international programming. Uh, we hope that you will be able to participate or at least uh, meaningfully view uh, a hands-on uh, virtual uh, global learning experience. Um, and we hope to familiarize you with the resources available uh, right now that you can take advantage of. So um, I'm sure you can see that beautiful um, little rectangle there, the virtual international programming uh, business class badge. Uh, we have those on offer for uh, faculty or anyone really who uh, completes all three of the sessions within this group of uh, virtual uh, learning experience um, CTE sessions. Uh, and those will be happening on the first of each subsequent month, meaning uh, the second one is on March 1st and the third one will be on April 1st. Um, so yeah, we're very excited to, to share these uh, kind of tips and tricks with y'all. And if you have any questions for us during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat box and we will address those uh, when we get a chance to. Um, so before we go too much further, we have a recording of one of our global partners um, 
from uh, Italy that, and, and she spoke uh, to our session last time, uh, the, the last time that we did this, uh, the, this group of sessions. So um, Gloria, if, if you could pull that up, we can uh, watch her kind of discuss um, what her role in a typical uh, global learning experience would be. Um, well, right now I am in the medieval castle of Poggio le Mura in the heart of our vineyard estate. It is 5, 10 p.m. in the afternoon, a rainy afternoon in usually sunny Tuscany. So I'm sitting indoors in the library room or the reading room, which is part of our hotel. Um, and the bottle next to me, I actually forgot to bring a bottle here. So this is a bottle on display on the mantle in the uh, background. It's uh, our Brunello di Montalcino, classical Brunello. Anfi is a vineyard estate that produces classical uh, wines, such as Brunello di Montalcino, proprietary blends. We're also an agricultural estate. We're a farm. The castle has actually been a farm since the Middle Ages. We produce, we grow wheat, we are the largest producers of dried plums, formerly known as prunes. Um, we, also, we have a, a very extensive hospitality operation, which this year, though, is operating on a different um, schedule, let's put it that way. So oh. tell us, and uh, we're... Um, Closing one of the restaurants earlier this season, um, but we're working very hard to uh, relaunching next year in March. When we also have to be able to relaunch our hospitality programs, our uh, scholastic tours, and the other activities we've had to put on hold. So we're so excited to, to have you um, as a guest lecturer for the pilot that we had back in May. Um, and I know that we'll, we'll speak about this course a little bit, but the topic of this course is luxury management. So I was wondering if you could tell our participants today um, a little bit like what you told our students, um, how the Castello embodies luxury and, um, and what that looks like for you in Italy. Um, the Castello embodies luxury, uh, his luxury, well, everything is luxury right now. But uh, history is luxury, wine can be luxury, uh, enjoying a meal with a glass of wine is luxury. So we've uh, dedicated ourselves to luxury uh, in many ways. Uh, Benzi actually, the United States, the U.S. Foundation started a study abroad program, the so-called Scholastic Tour, um, in 1973, actually uh, six years six years, five years before they purchased their property in Italy. So we've been leading students on international study programs for a very long time. And we miss that. Um, uh, we did have a lot of fun. I did have a lot of fun in, in um, May during the lockdown uh, with our hospitality, with our luxury management session. But, um, I, also missed very I missed Sandy Strick and the group very much this year. Um, the, it's one thing to uh, see um, see us on a video, but and see the surrounding landscapes. I remember I also walked around with my computer to show uh, the pad the vistas. But um, I think it is a very important experience uh, to put your feet on the ground. I come from a global background. My parents are Swiss from Zurich. Um, I spent my childhood in the United States. We relocated to Switzerland and I've been in Italy since 1982. So I am here. I'm a global element today and I look forward to the learning experience. Yes. So we ben, yeah, despite our remote location, we are about an hour and a half south of Florence and two hours north of Rome. Um, we have become a truly global community. Uh, we see 60,000 visitors a year from many different nations, um, from the United States, from South America, from Europe. Now, 
We've been seeing more Italians, more Europeans, so we stay, um, you know, we stay in touch, but um, we look forward to, um, to, the, to being able to share more of our hospitality with more guests. So after, after the pilot um, course in May, oh, and there's Sandy, she says we miss you too. <laughs> um, after the pilot course in May, did you have any other opportunities to um, be a guest speaker virtually, or um, has the Costello taken on any virtual programming? We've taken on virtual programming on social media. My colleagues have, especially during the harvest, now in September, um, and, and uh, at the beginning of October, I recorded a two and a half hour marathon session for a training course on wine tourism. Just me and my PowerPoint. That was probably the um, the worst experience I had because I don't like I like listening to my own voice, as you can say, and I can go on. But uh, two and a half hours was a very long time. Talk but just. To but they had to they had to uh the modules the through two and a half three hour modules come from training courses to acquire credits so um and the sessions were recorded so that uh because online or um direct teaching was not possible at the time and most of the uh, participants were professionals, so they could also follow the courses at any at their own uh, at their, with their own time frame. So we have done a lot. I mean, it has been yours was probably my first, and uh, after that, I uh, I also uh, everyone started, and for everyone, it was a learning experience also. Because we are much, uh, with a glass of wine, which I didn't bring in my hand, we're much more hands-on um, than, um, than online. Yeah. But it has been, uh, it has really helped us um, reach out when uh, we can't reach out otherwise. Yeah. So it has been a experience. And, um, uh, it was just a small consolation for not seeing the uh, University of South Carolina group in a week later in May. Oh, it's been a long time tradition, so we uh, it was it was really a lot of a lot of fun talking about luxury and what luxury means in these times, because it's not the same. Well, we, we so appreciated that you were able to speak with the students and um, they remarked on just how much they benefited from this course. And we'll talk about that a little bit later today. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for joining us this afternoon All right. for you. Perfect. <laughs> and um, if, if you have. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Gloria, for, for sharing that. So um, here we have a virtual tour uh, of the winery that um, she was speaking from uh, that y'all will be able to um, to take a look at here. I've posted it in the chat and I will also be sharing my screen here in a second uh, to give y'all kind of a live demonstration of it. Um, so this is gonna be an important um, thing for, for y'all to keep in mind as you begin uh, thinking about what exactly your virtual global learning experience is going to be. Uh, taking advantage of, um, of uh, resources like this is, is really an effective way of getting your students to, um, to get in the, um, the, the spirit of international travel. Um, so I would invite y'all to, um, on your own time, click through this. I'm just going to do a couple more just to show some of the kind of natural beauty uh, of this winery and to give your students a taste of what it is like to be in a, um, a country that they're unfamiliar with. 
So using this model, you can rotate around 300, 360 degrees and just take a virtual stroll through this winery. It, it really is beautiful. Um, so I would, I would recommend for, for y'all to, to take a look at that whenever you get a chance. So now we can get right back to our slides. So this is what a typical year for education abroad looks like. Um, you can see at the top part of this slide. According to Open Doors IAE data, we are ranked 19th in the nation for midterm study abroad. Um, so we're quite proud of that. And midterm is defined um, as a semester, something less than um, six months usually. We typically send about 800 students on a semester long exchange or academic year experience. Um, and according to last year's data, we are number 24 out of the top 25 top sending institutions, just in terms of overall study abroad numbers. We're also ranked number 24 out of the top 40 research one universities, and that is up from number 36 um, back in 2014. So the university has really um, done some really significant work in the last uh, five or six years. Additionally, uh, we support faculty-led programming for fall break, winter break, spring break, May master, and summer. And as such, when the coronavirus spread and multiplied across Europe and beyond, we knew that more and more students would be impacted by the university's strong recommendation that they return home. Ultimately, we recalled over 800 USC students home from their spring semesters and spring break programs um, back almost a year ago now. Additionally, as our Student International Travel Oversight Committee, um, we call them SITOC, met, we were soon faced with canceling faculty-led programming for the May semester and summer terms. So last year, it was really sad, of course, just like just in general, it was a sad year, but we had received more proposals from faculty to lead abroad than ever before, um, and very few programs have been canceled due to low student enrollment, so we were really elated to send those groups out, but ultimately, um, we had to cancel 46 faculty-led programs in the May semester and summer 2020 terms, which impacted over 500 students. At the same time, students who were planning to take a few courses over the summer, which students often do to stay on track with multiple majors or minors, were left out without plans to fulfill that co coursework. Um, so overall, the number of summer students who could not go abroad um, totaled to over 700. We could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in response to the, the forced move in spring, institutions and partner programs that we work with quickly shifted to online learning until the end of their term. So all of our students who returned home for the spring 20 semester, either to Columbia or to their parents somewhere else in the US, completed coursework and exams online. Once spring semester ended and it was clear the impacts of COVID-19 were going to continue, these same partners and universities began evaluating how to best serve students in international programming without the international traditional travel component. Summer is a popular time for students to study abroad in order to fulfill their internship requirements. So we saw an instant pivot by third party providers to virtual internships. These internships offered students the ability to work with an international office and professionals from their homes in the US. Third party providers use their existing partnerships and country to create these remote experiences for students. In the meantime, the Education Abroad Office was simultaneously instantly forced to delve into similar technology options um, with on-campus partners and otherwise to continue to support students who needed to complete their programs in spring and for the future of students who were soon to depart. There was also a demand on our campus, both from students and faculty, to continue internationalized learning. However, we quickly learned that there is a varying level of comfort from faculty in regards to online technology um, that's available to them. So we began to research how technology was used in the past to facilitate online international learning. We go to the next slide, please. You. At the onset of our research, we discovered the well-established SUNY Collaborative Online International Learning Program. After attending webinars and combing through the articles published about their successes with that program, we began modeling for what this could mean at U of SC. The COIL program um, or model pairs two courses at two different universities to complete a project and coursework together, all virtually. 
faculty and students from the US would video chat with a group of students and their instructor in Japan, say, and the course's learning outcomes would be built together. This program was established in 2004, and SUNY was able to grow their COIL program in terms of international partnerships, funding support, and training for faculty and staff. The American Council on Education led their first ever collaborative academy with COIL back in 2017, and they announced that COIL programs had expanded access to a global learning at home. With the restraints on physical travel from the pandemic and the growing student need for internationalized coursework and internships, we decided that this program um, was one that our university could benefit from. Uh, yes, that's, that's right. And in modeling for our programming, we narrowed in on one of COIL's models for a hybrid virtual exchange. So in this hybrid COIL model, a pre-existing course incorporates third party or outside materials into the professor's lecture uh, for a course with international components. So we knew this model already. It's how our global classroom programs work. Uh, and the way that goes is uh, a faculty member works with an international partnership to teach an already established course with international components. Uh, but one of the challenges uh, that we have is that we would be converted converting, sorry, global classrooms to completely virtual experiences. So within the Education Abroad Office, we assessed how we could support and guide the developmental conversation for, uh, for virtual education abroad, both for our third party providers and their courses and internships, as well as our own programming uh, with U of SE faculty. So we created our lists of requirements and gaps in programming caused by restrictions on uh, physical travel. Uh, we talked about that a little bit with um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And unfortunately, that's going to kind of color the way that we think about international education for years to come. But part of this, uh, like we, we want to be as proactive as possible with, with our virtual programming here. So. We knew that we would need to incorporate um, uh, graduating with leadership distinction, uh, global pathway requirements and experiential learning outcomes. So we were sensitive to the integrity of the proposed virtual experiences. Uh, and with that, we had to evaluate our policies and procedures for a um, physical study abroad experience and how we can transfer that into a virtual platform so that students can complete their degrees and certifications without hindrance. Um, so what we took from uh, COIL in our own research um, was what you're seeing here. We created our global learning experience portfolio. Uh, these programs are faculty led. They focus on internationalizing a current academic syllabus to uh, incorporate international uh, cultural elements into the curricula. So the difference between our GLEs and uh, global classroom programs is uh, the delivery of these courses. Uh, GLEs are strictly virtual. So uh, each GLE will be folded into our typical review processes with a few differences. Uh, there will not need to be a review of the health and safety of the location traveled to. That's one major example. Uh, however, a review of academics, uh, a thorough syllabus, and departmental approval will still need uh, to, to be shown for, for each GLE proposal. Uh, additionally, all logistics information requested for a global classroom will also be requested for GLEs. Uh, stuff like course dates, program fees, if that's applicable, use of provider, course code, so on, so on. Um, so this process and the requirements for our GLEs were proposed to and approved by uh, Sandra Kelly, Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Studies this past summer. So we expressed to her uh, just how important it was to us uh, to continue our legacy of supporting meaningful global programming while also upholding academic rigor. That has been our major goal throughout this whole process. Um, there we go. Okay, so um, in order to properly incorporate experiential benchmarks, each GLE is required to have a minimum of 25 hours of real world experience. 
per the uh, Center for uh, uh, Integrative and Experiential Learning. So, um, so these hands-on experiences will look a little bit different in the world of online education, obviously. Uh, but we do have a list of requirements and examples to help you build them into your course. So there are some mandatory requirements for each course, uh, such as the Global Competency Aptitude Assessment, uh, and we also have um, pre- and post-course Education Abroad led sessions. So these are mainly facilitated by the Education Abroad Office, and they require coordination with the faculty member, for example, uh, to schedule the synchronous orientation session and open the pre-made global competency assessment to students uh, pre-course. So the way the global competency assessments usually work is that uh, students are given an assessment before they travel and then the same assessment after they finish their course. Uh, and, and that is a means to show uh, improvement in, in a way that is data-driven. So. Other required activities will be more faculty driven, uh, like reflection, culminating projects, stuff like that. Uh, so after incorporating the mandatory activities into their syllabus, faculty are then encouraged to explore the possible activities that best fit their course. Uh, for example, some courses may want to incorporate language lessons throughout the GLE, uh, while others may want to focus on business visits or guest lectures. So, if you're really techy, or if uh, someone in your department has uh, access to that level of uh, virtual engagement, you can even create uh, some virtual atmospheres on Second Life, um, which is a, a, a kind of virtual reality simulator um, for students to explore with their avatars. Um, that's an example of going above and beyond. Uh, each GLE proposal will also need to explicitly note reflection and feedback experiences throughout the course. Reflection is a really important aspect of, of a successful GLE. Um, some ways that you can do this are through Blackboard discussion posts, journals, Padlets, um, and there are more examples that I'm sure you can think of that you are already kind of using in your courses. We really encourage you to repurpose and re-envision uh, practices that you are already doing to fit within a GLE kind of uh, scenario. So um, the, the goal, like I said, is to encourage student reflection and to provide a place for the faculty leader to offer feedback. Uh, finally, GLEs are required to have a culminating project. So this could be a business proposal, it could be a letter to local politicians, really anything that um, shows student progression and engagement with the material uh, is, is something that you can use here. Uh, it's definitely an opportunity for y'all to get creative as you build your courses. So the requirements and steps to lead abroad are outlined in our Global Classroom Resources uh, Blackboard which all current and previous faculty have access to. Um, all faculty and staff interested in leading a program are encouraged to submit their email to our website uh, to be added to the site. So ultimately our uh, GLEs accomplish the internationalized goals of the faculty leading the course uh, while also keeping students engaged while it's entirely online. Right, so the pilot GLE um, that the speaker earlier referenced occurred this past Baymester. That was a kind of a result of the cancellation of a much beloved global classroom due to travel restrictions um, from the pandemic. And that was led by um, two faculty in the HRSM department, Sandy Strick and Karen Edwards. Once they found out that their May master program was not going to be able to run, they were able to pivot to offer their courses in the GLE platform. So Sandy and Karen invited guests like the one you heard earlier um, that would have visit they would have visited in country to give guest lectures on luxury management. Um, additionally, because they were not bound by one location in Italy like a normal travel program would have been, Sandy and Abel, Sandy and Karen were able to invite more guests and visit more sites virtually within Italy rather than staying in Florence as they had done in past years. They asked their students to take an asynchronous virtual tour of a luxury hotel and walk around using Google Maps to street view from the airport to their hotel. 
they could virtually visit the Sistine Chapel and look up and text or talk with their buddy about their experience and what they were seeing. So trying to recreate that um, same type of travel experience that they might have had in a normal year. Um, Jenna Reese White, uh, who you also kind of saw in the video earlier, um, who is the one who was supporting all of our faculty-led programming up until last Friday when she moved on to a great new job. Um, she facilitated that program along with Sandy and Karen, along with one of our Education Abroad Advisors, Anuja Farik. Jenna and Anuja worked together um, to deliver the Global Competency Assessment to students that James talked about earlier. They also built in um, synchronous Italian-specific orientation sessions to get students comfortable with the virtual platform and the GLE in itself. Um, and that was complete with a guest speaker who was a current exchange student at USC from Italy um, who helped um, kind of orient the students to this Italian virtual environment. Um, additionally, Jenna and Anuja also acted as program assistants to Sandy and Karen, checking in with students through GroupMe to discuss any upcoming assignments, um, synchronous sessions, and updates the students with um, any type of relevant Italian-based facts each day. Um, uh, Jenna and Anuja also helped um, troubleshoot any tech issues um, throughout the program. Okay, uh, so as we've mentioned, we definitely do not expect faculty members to build uh, GLEs alone. Uh, so the roles here are outlined for each type of participant in the process. So faculty will be tasked with creating the academic syllabus, but they are encouraged to request support uh, in adding the GLE requirements with Education Abroad staff. We are here to help y'all out. Uh, they will lead the course as faculty, but um, so, you know, all the normal faculty course leading things that you do, lecturing, grading, feedback. Uh, additionally, faculty will be responsible for officially proposing the GLE in our system and requesting approval to lead the course from their department. Uh, however, when it comes to most other responsibilities, those can be shared. Uh, so, Education Abroad staff are responsible for facilitating the two mandatory synchronous sessions at the beginning and end of the course, as well as administering the Global Competency Aptitude Assessment. So, depending on faculty needs, our staff can make connections uh, with international partners for faculty, as well as find or create asynchronous material for the course. So, while faculty will be the main point of recruitment uh, for the course, you know, recruiting students, um, our office can market the GLE to students through social media, newsletter, other outlets. Uh, international partners have the smallest role in GLEs because they will typically not interact with your students throughout the course. Um, international partners may appear once to a few times during the course to give lectures, either synchronous or asynchronous tours, uh, so on. You will typically uh, have more than one uh, international partner. So while your course will have many global aspects, they may not come from a singular partnership. Uh, so in the pilot example that we've been talking about, Sandy and Karen had five different international partners to work with. Um, you may also be using third-party providers to incorporate all the requirements to globalize your course. If this is the case, you will be able to plan your virtual itinerary with a singular touch point, and that person will be responsible for, uh, for coordinating. So if this is the case, uh, you will be able to plan your virtual itinerary with that singular touch point, and that person, um, like I said, they'll, they'll be responsible for, for helping you out. Uh, so finally, the students do have a role to play in the success of, this, uh, of your GLE. The expectation for the students is that they follow the Blackboard itinerary, they do the assignments, they complete the asynchronous uh, material with their assigned buddy if you want to use the buddy system for your course, um, and attending the synchronous sessions, all the normal things that students are expected to do. Uh, they should also prepare for synchronous sessions beforehand to maximize their experience with the guest lecture, tour guide, language partner, so on.
Thanks. Um, and as you can see here on this slide, these are just some of the universities um, that we're aware of who are participating in some form of virtual education abroad. Um, you'll see Clips' logo up there. Um, they support a program called International Virtual Exchange. They're also in the midst of creating a virtual partnership database, um, much like we've seen with COIL. Um, and along those same lines, um, the State University of New York, or SUNY, um, has an entire network of campuses in New York that participate in COIL programming. Um, additionally, they've also created some training for faculty to join in COIL programming, um, and those are called the COIL Academy and COIL uh, Course Orientation. You can find many universities incorporating third-party virtual options like Northeastern has or creating programming similar to ours. Uh, so the move to virtual international programming is certainly spreading um, as we've experienced in the universities promoting this type of program um, and training for this type of program. But in addition to the successes we've experienced in the programming that other universities have created, we did want to share um, some of the benefits of GLEs that we're seeing and anticipating for students. Um, so I just saw a question in the chat about um, the cost of these types of programs um, and certainly a big benefit um, compared to traditional study abroad is the financial aspect. While we do offer as many scholarships as we can through our office, and there are certainly many national scholarships that students can apply to for to fund a study abroad program, it is still simply too expensive for some students, barring them from receiving a global experience. GLEs can be as inexpensive as costing students no additional program fee. Um, in, they do have to, at USC, they do pay in-state tuition, so like they would for a traditional summer course to answer Shauna's question. Um, but they don't need plane tickets, money for food and shopping, housing, international travel insurance, visas, and all of these other things um, that can really add up um, for a traditional study abroad student. Additionally, um, as I just said, because these courses are recognized by our university as education abroad courses, students do pay the in-state tuition rate regardless of whether they're in-state or out-of-state students. Um, that's been the case for a long time for uh, traditional study abroad students participating in global classroom programs, um, but it is now the case as well for students participating in these global learning experiences. In addition to the financial benefits, students who are locationally bound can also now experience education abroad. Um, previously, we had students who reached out to us who were bound to Columbia because of family obligations or work obligations um, or even university obligations, um, like our athletes are who might not have the time to leave Columbia. Uh, so these students can now participate in education abroad while continuing to um, fulfill those obligations they have locally. It's also important to note that some students may never physically study abroad due to disabilities, uh, whether physical or mental. A student who wants to travel abroad may be physically limited by their location the location's accessibility that they're interested in. Uh, for instance, many European countries do not have an equivalent of the ADA, so ramps are not always available in those old buildings for those who need them. Uh, for these students, then, it's important that they can have an education abroad experience without compromising the location or the course um, that they're interested in or need to take. And finally, with the growing popularity of our global classrooms, our traditional faculty-led programs, faculty are faced with turning students away due to course size restrictions. When physically traveling, there might simply not be enough room to support a larger group. While this is not always the case, um, we do have some larger student groups that travel. We also know that there are students seeking out globalized experience globalized experiences that are limited by group size. Um, so in future coordination um, of GLEs, we envision supporting both a physical and a virtual program simultaneously um, to accommodate these students. And for all of these student groups, we would always encourage them to physically study abroad when possible and provide um, means of support where available. But we also realize that traditional physical study abroad does not reach all of these groups equally. And we know that GLEs can provide more access and inclusive programming for previously untapped student groups. We do know that planning and building a GLE can take a lot of time, and we want to make sure you know that you are not alone in building this experience. On campus, the Center for Teaching Excellence has standalone workshops and certification series that can help support uh, your knowledge in building the online aspects of your GLE. For instance, CTE is supporting this mini-series that you're all participating in now, which we're really grateful for. 
They also have their Carolina Online Teaching and Learning Certificate, which is paired up with the Office of Distributed Learning and eLearning Services to bring faculty the tools to teach online. You can find more certificates like these on their website. We would always also recommend um, the Integrative and Experimental Learning Certificate for GLEs. Distributed Learning offers faculty a toolbox for online teaching and technology in the classroom. They offer faculty support uh, from experienced producers, media specialists, and logistics coordinators um, that can all help out with the production of a course. Your department also has various points of support in building your GLE. Your department or college most likely has an alumni outreach coordinator who you can work with to find previous USC students working abroad who can speak to your course and material in the field abroad. Um, your department or college may also have international agreements in the location you are hoping to focus on in your GLE. These established partnerships um, can be a great resource um, for guest lecturers, live tours, and language practice for students. Of course, you have the support from our office, the Education Abroad Office. Uh, just like with Sandy and Karen's course, our staff will be there to support your GLE build as little or as much as you desire. Um, from the planning stages to the course itself, our staff are here um, to help you find international partners, plan synchronous and asynchronous uh, class sessions, engage students, um, keep students feeling supported throughout the experience, um, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, Morgan. Um, so I, I know that we are bumping right up against the end of our session, and I want to make sure that we respect everyone's time. So um, we have all these resources available to you that we have discussed uh, throughout this session. You can find them uh, through the Education Abroad uh, website. You can find them through Blackboard. For now, we look forward to uh, chatting with y'all again. Uh, once again, this is a three-part uh, CTE series, and we look forward to speaking with y'all again in part two.